You're listening to the Multifamily Mentor Show. My name is Terrence Doyle. And I'm Chris Lopez. You probably know us from the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Ride Along Show. Well, now we're talking everything multifamily. We bring in top industry experts from around the country to come join us in our Denver studio for an in-depth, in-person conversation. We're gonna be diving deep into deals, underwriting, raising capital, and everything in between. Join the conversation. What's up, Bigger Pockets? Welcome back to another tribe of multi-family mentors here at Bigger Pockets. My name is Chris Lopez. We have a great guest in the studio today. But first, gotta talk to Terrence, my co-host. Terrence, how are you? Fantastic. My lunch has digested, and I'm super excited about this episode. We have a fellow immigrant to the United States, Reed Goosens, in the house, moved to the United States in 2012, has written several books, owns and operates over 2,700 units, background as a structural engineer, just an all-around total baller, and very excited to have him here. So, Reed, welcome to the tribe of multifamily mentors. Thank you, lads, for having me here. Ball is a big word, but uh, no, dude, you're a baller. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. Sure. <laughs> dude, you're one of, yeah. <laughs> Listen, in my world, you're a baller. I'm really, uh, we were really excited to have you. Thank We've you. loved getting to know you. It's been a really fun afternoon. So let's jump right into it. We've got let's a lot to it. cover. Let's so tell us, you're an immigrant. Tell us about coming to the United States. True. Sure. You're in the Big Apple, mm-hmm. 2012. You want to get into real estate. Tell us what that's like and how your journey started. Yeah, well, so the, the the falling in love story, I moved to the United States for two loves. One was for, for, a, for a girl that I met on the beaches in San Sebastian in Spain back in 2009. And the other one was to, to just be an expat in New York City. That was really it. Um, I had been bitten by the real estate bug prior to moving to the United States because I spent two years gallivanting around the south of France and in Europe after I graduated uni. We can talk about that in a little bit. Those were some great times. Uh, and that's where I met my wife, well, yeah. uh, well, now wife. And it was just more like I was back in Australia and I'm like, I don't want to sit in a cubicle right, for the rest of my life as a structural engineer. I'd spent two years abroad. This is, oh, this is 2010. And I'm like, stumble upon the book, Rich Edge, Poor Dad. And that's really where the, the spark desire within me. I'm sure a lot of people listening to the show are just like, yeah, screw you know, I love studying structural engineering, but actually in the workforce and sitting in a cubicle, feeling like you're a small cog in a large machine and just sort of watching your life go by, you know, seven, five days a week, you know, through you know, whatever it is, you're getting two weeks off a year. It was just wasn't for me. You know, I knew I did more to give and that was the inspiration. And then it sort of led down the path of, okay, well, why real estate, right? Like, And that was Rich Dad Poor Dad. Well, oh, I'm a structural engineer. I, I already build stuff. That makes sense. Yeah, let's keep going. And so it was pulling that thread, right? And then it, it unwinding. But then the moving to the United States was was for the, the love of being wanting to be an expat in New York City and then chasing, chasing a girl as well. Yeah, and how difficult was that? New York City, I mean, there's so much money everywhere, very clicky. I mean, people from all over the world, so much affluence. I mean, what? how difficult was that to like find your way into, I mean, I think that would be overwhelming. You're seeing hundred million dollar, billion dollar buildings and structures all around you. And you're, you know, I'm guessing didn't have a ton of money no. and you're like, I want to buy real estate. I mean, me well, personally, I'd feel like in that situation, I might've been a little bit overwhelmed. So how did you overcome that and get into your first deal? Well, yeah. So the, the, the first thing was just getting the job, right? I, again, I was moving to the United States to, to maybe live here for two years move back to Australia. The, the the thing, the beauty about Aussies is that the only reason I could come here was we have a really, really good uh, working visa with the United States. So I came here on a tourist visa, three months. I had not a job. I had three months to find a job. And so I pounded the pavement. I went to all the structural engineering firms in New York City, knocked on doors, knocked on doors until someone said yes. And I was no, 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 no. Yes. Once I got that yes and I got the, the visa to stay, then it was about, okay, Let's start this this life with my with my new girlfriend that I just moved off across the world to be with, you know, moving to the Big Apple, and then from there it was like, all right, I, I still want to learn real estate, and oh my god, look at excuse me, look at all these incredible networking opportunities, and I was at my first rear event within the first two weeks of being fresh off the boat. So it was a lot of things, a lot of moving pieces to try and just get on get on my two feet here, right? It was the job, um, moving in with the girlfriend. How much time did you have to get the job uh, before like, you would have had to leave? Three months. You had ninety days. Yep. So you had a shot clock. Every yep. day you're like, I got to go get a job. I had to. I actually left the country 
I'd gone for interviews and I and it was coming up. The clock was coming up and I jumped across the border to Canada and like waited out there until like someone said yes. I'd already signed a twelve month lease with the girlfriend and I was like, I hope someone says yes. <laughs> oh really? You had to go to Canada? Yep. Because your ninety days had expired. Correct. And I was just I was like, how did that how did that interview go? And they're like, yeah, we'll get back to you next week. And then I waited. I think I waited two weeks in Canada until someone finally said yes. And then I had to apply for the visa in Canada. And once I that took another two weeks and then I finally got could, could come back. So wow. you get that's incredible. The perseverance, I love that. <laughs> perseverance. So you get the job, mm -hmm. and then how quickly after the job are you like, okay, now I want to go get and buy a property? Well, that so like that first 90 days, like I was doing everything networking related. I was playing rugby for New York Rugby Club. You know, I was going to already going to the rear events. So I'd already like, okay, there's a thing here. There's, let's just go back there. And then the biggest thing I realized was, geez, the barriers to entry in these secondary tertiary markets are. So nuts like i could buy something for 30 40 thousand dollars like I, I think i came to the united states with like 40 g's in my pockets that i that i'd saved myself well amazing and and so once i got the job going once i got you know settled and i was like all right let's let's start putting you know pen to paper and i remember riding the subway to new york uh, in new york city to work no stuck in a book and just realizing like and again i'd been educating for the last two years up, up until that point this is middle of 2012 i'd picked the book rich i put in 2010 so there was a lot of education and there's a lot like i was already like let's go let's go let's go but i didn't know what to do and it wasn't until moving to the u.s realizing that there was these secondary tertiary markets that i could pay all cash for and i could get going in, a, in my first deal and i was like screw it i don't get to deal number 10 but until you do deal number one and i had a little bit of money in the bank account and no no bank was lending to me because i was I had no credit score and I bought my first property, thirty-eight thousand dollars. I think I was six months in the country after moving here. So help me understand, because I love how you did that all, and I want to unpack that a little bit. But what are the secondary and tertiary markets around New York City? Because I can't even think of something. I mean, when I think of New York, I just think of like that island Syracuse. buildings. How far away did you have to go to get to Syracuse? So there's a four-hour drive. It was. I sort of drew like a, a four-hour radius around. So New anything York City. within four hours of Manhattan, downtown New York, New York, I could, Main I could Street. Get to, I, I could get to. And I. And you were driving a car or taking no, a train? I was. I was getting the Greyhound bus on a Saturday. You know, wake up Saturday morning, get the Greyhound bus from Penn Station, seven a.m. Would be up in Syracuse by eleven, eleven thirty. Broker would pick me up. Would go cruise around to a few deals. Back on the bus by two thirty. Back in New York City for the beer with the boys by uh, seven o'clock at night. Beer with the boys, <laughs> exactly. So, so how are you? The, I'm really interested in this. So the brokers, mm -hmm. this was like before Bigger Pockets. I mean, how are you finding these brokers in Syracuse? Again, through the networking of in the rears, knowing that hey, do you know any brokers in upstate New York? And just asking enough people, and, and I met, meeting a few people who are already doing deals up there, and they're, they're already showing. Like I didn't know about Syracuse until someone said. And you know, no offense to Syracuse, it wasn't like this great city, but it, you know, it's a great, it's a great enough. Yeah, besides city. the university, I don't know anything else there. No, no, but it was an affordable city, right? right? And so I already I met two people in the New York area who were doing cheaper properties in upstate New York, duplexes wow. and triplexes, and that was all that I was like, "Who's your broker? Who's oh. your property manager? Who's your GC?" And that 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 was it. So all well, that well, that was it. Then I had to be like, call them, like, "Hey, can you pick me up from the from the bus station?" <laughs> so you closed your first property cash. Mm -hmm. by going to, I just want to summarize this because I, I love the action. I mean, because so many people, they love listening, digesting content. I mean, I, we've met people that are like, man, we've listened to your show for two or three years and we just want to buy our first property. And it's like, do it, take action. Do you it. know, I mean, you had spent time reading, you were in New York, you were networking, you went to the events, you put yourself out there, you're meeting people, asking questions, and you knew that you had cash. You didn't, I mean, what I think stands out is that you didn't have any excuses. Right. You know, because a lot of people could have said, well, I can't get debt. I, you know, I don't even have my visa. I'm not a citizen. You know, the list goes on and on. And you were like, no, no, no. I have, what can I buy within four hours of here? And I'm going to go find it. I didn't even know you could find a property that cheap within four hours of New York. Right. You get outside New York City, you think Philadelphia is cheap as cheap as well. Like it's- uh, It's amazing it, info. Yeah. But I just think that's the application right there is regardless of where you're at in your journey. If you network, ask questions, and then take action. You got to get in the game. One hundred percent. And the thing was, for those people listening, is like the big step was moving here. That whole process of getting a freaking job and sweating it out in Canada and moving in with a new girlfriend, like that was the that was the big step. So so getting on a bus to Syracuse and talking to a few, like, oh, there's some random Aussie here. Like, <laughs> that was easy. You know, that was this the guy easy won't stop stuff. calling me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. that that it was. You push your boundaries and you get comfortable pushing your boundaries. And yeah, I didn't know what was going to happen. But I did, I did get comfortable with the fact that if something went wrong with this property, it was my money, no one else's money, so be it. And, but at least, I, at least I gave it a go. So you had $40,000 in your checking account, roughly. You bought this property for thirty-eight. Yep. 
And was it rented? It, it, it was rented. It was a triplex. It was, uh, I think it was like a 12 or 13 cap. And I quickly realized what Section 8 housing was all about as a fresh-faced, bushy-eyed tail Australian. First six <laughs> months going great. <laughs> then there was a drive-by shooting. Wow. And it wasn't any of the tenants, but it was a son of the tenant. And it was just a real eye-opener that, you know, you can make money in those sort of Section D class of Section 8 housing, Class D Section 8 housing, but you have to be strategic. And a lot of international investors were buying that stuff because at the time, the Aussie dollar was very comparable to the US dollar. Wow. And so a lot of people were like buying these, um, what are they called? The um, turnkey properties. Okay. But I was just sort of doing the pre-turnkey. I was doing it myself. You know, so I'd learned about this stuff and I was like, ah, screw it, I can go do it myself. And But it got me into the deal number two because I established a, a relationship with a local bank in Syracuse. Mm. They saw that I was depositing rental checks. And so I got a line of credit for $25,000 and I got deal number two. So again, it was just about putting one foot in front of the other, learnt along, a lot along the way. And I wouldn't have learnt what I learnt by reading books. And again, I'd already be educating for about two and a half years. So I'd got to analysis paralysis by that point. I was like, let's just go out and do this. It's, you know, so. So walk us, I mean, because you had every excuse as to why you can never go buy a property. I mean, mm -hmm. lending, lack of credit, those are hard uh, hurdles to overcome here in the US That's for an foreign LLC. nationals. What it's stuff, yeah. So how did you get the first property? You got the second. Walk us through now how you've got hundreds or thousands of units under your belt. I mean, it's a very impressive journey that you've, that you've been it, on. It, it, look, thank you. Um, and, I, and trust me, for people who are listening to this, it's not about banging my chest. It's more about you know encouraging people to go out and take action. So yeah, the, the whole journey from there actually came through a very strategic conversation with a buddy of mine. End of 2013, I was I bought the second property. I was about to buy a fix and flip in Philly. But I was coming to the end of my tether on lending. Like I wasn't earning a ton of money. I think I was earning like 65 Gs in New York City as a structural engineer. So it wasn't like, and New York City is freaking expensive. That's so, not much for New York City. No, that's not much. And and so, but I was still just trying to make every, squeeze every dollar. Um, and a buddy of mine came down from Canada who I'd studied with in Australia. And I said, hey man, like I've got these five units in Syracuse and I'm crushing, I'm going to do a flicks and flip. And he's and he's like, that's great, Reed. That's great. And, <laughs> and then he goes on to tell me, he's like, uh, I've, I just closed on a 70 unit deal. And I was like, 70, like <laughs> seven zero. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, how the did you do that? And he went on to tell me about mentors, about other people's money, about getting seller caravan financing, all these things I'd learned, been learning about in the rears and in the, the real estate clubs, but he'd gone out and applied it. Now he's a guy who's directly in my sphere. I, he was already a buddy of mine. And I was like, well, if he can do it, why can't I do it? And that's where I, you know, up until that point, I was like, I've been putting off getting a, a mentor for so long. And that's when I finally said, stuff it, I'm going to go get a mentor. And we did not pay Reed to say that. I mean, this is called the Tribe of Multifamily Mentors. Chris and I met on Bigger Pockets. We really believe strongly in mentors. Mentors have completely shaped my life and my career. And when I heard you talk about that, we were talking about this at lunch, I mean, I was blown away. That like the number one thing that really helped you get from and there's nothing wrong. Duplexes, triplexes, fix and flip. I started there. It's a great way to learn. And you can make a lot of money. Then you, you can make a lot of money. And a lot of people do them tremendously well. Yep. And what what helped you, you know, perspective, right, is when you got that perspective from your friend that had a 70 unit, the number one thing he said was, I got a mentor. Yep. I got a mentor and I used other people's money. Correct. So then you had that. So he gives you that advice. And now your mind is blown. You're like, man, I thought I was like crushing it with seven units. He's got 70. And I think that really changed your paradigm, right? You're like, sure. oh, I can go bigger. No, you, it's possible. If he's doing it, I can do it. And that's really what I love about what we're doing is it's the same thing. Growing up in Des Moines, Iowa from South America, it's like, if I can do it and I can tell other people, we can inspire people that it's attainable, it's possible, they can go do it. And so walk us through those next steps then. He tells you, get a mentor, use other people's money. And then how did you get, because I love this story. I mean, you ended up finding a mentor that's like maybe the number one guy in the multifamily space. Yep. Yep. So yeah, so I, 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 I did end up liquidating uh, those two properties in in Syracuse. I think I only owned them for about two years. Didn't didn't lose any money, made a bit of money, made some good experience. Uh, and then I found a mentor and he, you know, everyone knows who he is, Joe Fairless. Uh, I think I might've been his, I, I wanna say l l definitely top five, like first five students. I think he'd done one deal prior to that. But here's the thing, and for those people listening, it was about taking a bet on myself, right? Up until that point, I'd been, I'd seen the guys running to the back of the room, signing up for the bus tours and the mentors and the gurus pitching on stage. And I was like, ooh, that feels so gross. I even feel, saw that in Australia. And it was up until that point, I was like, no, 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 not going to do that, not going to do that, not going to do it. And here I'm 2013, my buddy's telling me about getting the mentor. I knew that I was sort of getting to the 
like I was making a little bit of cash flow, but I wasn't quitting my day job anytime soon. And it needed up my game. And that was the money I paid for Joe, which in comparison was bloody cheap. Looking all those years back, and he, he, you know, he'd only done one deal. Was uh, betting on myself, right, and learning to bet on myself, and that was the, give myself permission that I'm worth taking this to the next level, and that that's that was the power of mentorship. Joe was he didn't give me any silver bullet, right? I, there's a lot of freaking hard work there, but it was a sounding board, someone I could turn to, and I, I you know, Joe and I, um, I think he was my mentor for a couple of years, and then we you know went our separate ways, and you know I, I helped helped him along the way as well. So it was a, it was a, we both learnt from one another, and that was that's the beauty of mentors, and that's the beauty of being surrounded by people you aspire to be, because iron sharpens iron, and you 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 will get sharper with with other people who you surround yourself with. So like what from a tactical standpoint did the mentorship, was it the fact, was it a tidbit you learned from him or was it the fact that you just bet on yourself, you wrote a check? No. Like yeah. where did you go from there to then start scaling up? Yeah, so you went through his, he had a program and, okay. and you know, learning about, you know, underwriting larger deals and, and learning about um, syndication and putting PPMs together and all that sort of stuff um, and how to find deals and how to, look, you know, find deals in different markets. Um, but the big thing that he, you know, Joe has a really great marketing background was that he sort of challenged me to do my podcast, to start my podcast investing in the US. He's like, you've got a story there, tell it. Mm. And I'm a, you know, I'm the structural engineer. I got no idea. I didn't know what a podcast was. This is late 2014. And I'm like, stuff it, let's go. And I started talking about, and I just thought, well, I know a lot of international folks are trying to come to the United States and invest here. I've just gone through this whole rigmarole of, understanding the lingo and LLC and all that crap. And I was like, someone's going to listen to it besides my mom and my grandma. And it, I just, I started, I started from there. And it was just, again, putting one foot in front of the other. I didn't know what it was going to turn out to be, but you know, the podcast has been going for now six years now, over 300 episodes and get to meet you boys. You know, like it's opened up a lot of doors and help up my game uh, in, in a way that I would never have expected it to. Yeah. I mean, one of the guys that I look up to just, from virtual social media is, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V. And, you know, his big thing is document, document, document. Everybody has something to say, regardless of what, what industry you're in, you know, whether you're a dentist, whether you're a vet, uh, you have a lawn care company or you're in real estate. I mean, you can document your story of building, overcoming obstacles, building relationships, solving problems, all these things. And people, will find it interesting if you just document. You don't have to make it, you know, that's one of the things I've really learned from Chris is, you know, there's nothing sexy about it. It's just, you show up, you're consistent and document. And the fact that, you know, Joe had the foresight to tell you that and that you took action again on that. And I think that's one of the great things about your story is you didn't have all the answers. It didn't wasn't like the best thing. And your first three triplex wasn't the best deal ever, but you took action. And because you took action, you got disproportionate returns on that from your experience. Yep. Maybe not just the capital, but your experience. And I love that, you know, is, you know, you do have an interesting story. You know, you're and we were just on the Q&A and how many people that were international that related to you yeah. and that wanted to like engage with you because they had that in common. And so, and everybody has that though. It's not just, you know, you're international, but everyone has a unique background and something that people will relate with if they just document and step out. Maybe it's going to be uncomfortable at first. It is. You know, even what we do. I mean, this, I never thought we'd be doing a podcast show and any of that. I mean, that's definitely not anything I have training in, but, uh, you know, take action, step out, be uncomfortable and document your story. It's, it's the big thing that people ask me, like, what drives you in, in the beginning? And it still drives me today is fear of regret. Like so many people want the answer. I'm going to go do, I'm going to go buy this building, right. but I need to have all the answers. Is this going to go well? It may not go well. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And you need to be okay with that and not look back when you're 70 years of age and go, dang, I wish I'd got on that plane to America. <laughs> so I love the story of you and Joe and your first deal. So, you know, we're not trying to like, you know, beat our chest or talk about name drop, name drop, but- I think it is really cool because sure. you know Joe's gone on. I think they have billion or more under management. Yep. I mean, he is one of like the godfathers of multifamily <laughs> syndication. Yep. I mean, the last ten years he's just crushed it. And someone that I, you know, I've read his book. I mean, been on his podcast. I mean, the guy's he's a legend. He's, a, he's, he's an great. OG. He's, yeah, he's, he's an OG he's in great. the multifamily game. So talk about how you're in his class and that story of how your first deal comes together that you were really a big part of. So moved so 2014, relocate from LA to uh, sorry, New York to LA was where my wife's from. And I start um 
a, a local meetup just because I was like, you know what, I'm new to this, I'm new to this country, this, this city. I need to like get get a name for myself. And I just started inviting people to a local bar, and I think it was one Thursday month. It was meetup.com. I called it something weird like the downtown Los Angeles real estate club, you know, and and people started showing up. And then through that club, I met a gentleman by the name of Frank Rosler. He didn't, I don't think he actually came to the event, but someone introduced me, was like, you need to talk to this guy, Frank. Frank was also working, um, and for those people who don't know, Frank is Joe's partner at Ashcroft Capital. And and yeah, I, I, Joe is a very good marketer, but I think Frank's probably the brains a little bit behind that. And, and, and I met Frank and he was working and had, as an asset manager for another multifamily company buying deals in Texas. And Frank taught me like institutional level underwriting. And so he and I sort of hit it off. We had a you know a few drinks and he was showing me these deals. And like I kind of knew a little bit. And I was like, oh, that's they seems like really freaking good deals. And he's like, man, I want to, I want to, and he had the hustle, like he he was probably a few years ahead of me, but he had like, I'm I want to go do this by myself like tomorrow. And I was wow. like, oh well, man, I'm I just, I just freaking moved here, but like <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to like, you know, like right. and so he was like, I'm just going to go do it. I'm going to put this deal under contract. And I was like, good on, like, that's freaking awesome. <laughs> and he's like, but I need help raising capital. I was like, well, apparently Joe knows how to raise capital. Um, and this, again, Joe, I think Joe had done one deal prior to that and um, introduced them. And I, do, I think Joe actually said no the first time. And it wasn't until I sort of gave him a little bit of like, come on, bro, like, this is like, like, I'm sure you can do something here. And, you know, that was the sort of the rest is history. They've gone off to create Ashcroft Capital and they've, they've got, you know, over 10,000 units. And yeah, but you were in that deal, though. I was in that deal. You're I, in that the, deal. The I mean, that was your first big deal. 250 units. It was a seven cap in Houston, Texas. I still remember it today. It was 250 units. And I think it was like for 14 million bucks or whatever that it's like. Insane. Not, it was Insane. nuts. Right. And I think they only just recently sold that. Um, so, and then I, then from there, I helped, I, I, I no, helped, I was involved in a few of their earlier deals, like raising a little bit of capital on the side, uh, with them. So, yeah. And I yeah. love that story because I mean, you're being very modest, but you, you know, it wasn't like you had the capital or even had the broker relationships or any of that. You're new to LA, you're, you know, getting mentored by someone that has a lot of experience and knowledge and you meet this guy and he says, Hey, I need some help. And you put it together, you know, and and uh, and even perseverance again is when, you know, Joe initially or whoever you can substitute Joe for in your life, you know, said, no, nah, this isn't for me. You said, hey, no, came back, encouraged him, opened his eyes and, you know, created a lot of value there that you, you know, even though you weren't a big part of the GP, you're in the deal and you got to part of it. And I think that did give you confidence to sure. go on and do your own thing. And so there's a lot of people out there listening. They're in the same place. I mean, Chris and I talk to him all the time. How do I get started? I want to do this. They have these aspirations and the motivation and they have the dreams and they can do the same thing. They can put a deal like that together. They can code. They can go to someone like Chris who's in Denver and say, Hey, Chris, I know this guy, he's got this deal and you know, you can put, help put it together. And so I think that there's a lot to learn from that. There's a lot of applicable, you know, tangible action that they can take from that story in in everyone's life that we can we can do more than we think even if we don't have all the answers that we could play a small part in maybe a bigger story uh, to add value it's all about adding value it, it is all about adding value and, it, and again it wasn't that i was going with my hand out and saying hey if i introduce you to you need to be giving me xyz it was just like you you two should definitely do something like you clearly have he, like frank's a like he was a dude that was about to quit his job and I'm like, well, good on you. Like I couldn't even think of that far ahead yet. Joe was already going to create something awesome regardless of, you know, how to right. introduce them. So there were two dudes that were like, I don't know how you even classify them. Like, you know, these asteroids shooting through space, right. like going to do whatever. And they just happened to collide. And I happened to be part of the the place, the thing. Yeah, that it's incredible. <laughs> I mean, listen, that's incredible. And everyone in their own sphere of influence can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where it just comes down to always about, yeah, networking and adding value. Oh, I can connect this person here, connect this person here. Like it, it leads to things. Sure. It's that small compounding effect that in one, three, 10 years, it leads to great things. Yep. And that's a lot of times people overlook, like just create value, network, and truly if I know Terrence can help you at Reed, I'm going to connect you guys. Yep. Because that comes back in karma, whatever you call it. Well, and I will say, and like, I won't say it too loudly, but Frank did help me on the first deal that that we went out and bought by ourselves in strategic GP roles. We could just leave it there. So but. let's go into that. I love that. <laughs> let's let's go into this because that's a great transition. Let's talk about. So you help put that together. You learn, and I think you know you may or may not 
communicated, but I definitely think subconsciously seeing that get put together yeah. gave you that confidence. Like, For hey, sure. Frank just left his job and went and did all this. I can do that. Just like yep. your buddy that had the 70 units. Yep. It's like, if you can touch it, that's one of the things for me. Like if I can see someone do it, I'm like, okay, I can do it. Exactly. If I just see it, you yeah. know? And I think subconsciously you seen that all get together in your mind. You're like, oh yeah, I can go do that. Have, have you ever, I, I enjoy <laughs> jumping off tall cliffs, but you always let someone else jump off before you because <laughs> right. you're just like, Oh, he can do it. Okay, let's yeah. go. You know, like, like if right. you're the first person, like, nah, 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 it'll take you like 10 minutes. But if I see someone jump, I'm always like, yeah, great, let's go. It's you know, great. It's make great. sure the water is deep enough yeah, to yeah. Out, right? Did he survive? Yeah, yeah. yeah good, cool. <laughs> oh, he is walking. Great. Yeah, 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 yeah let me, yeah, let me yeah, jump. Yeah, yeah. 100%. So let's get into that. Sure. Let's get into the transition for you. So, yeah, so it, and, and, and I'm compounding it all, but like it was a period between 2013 to I think our first deal was in 2000. So it was a period of like three years, right? And, and a lot of other stuff happened along the way. But our first deal, and when I say our, it's my business partner and I, Andrew Campbell, we, we started Wild Home Capital together. Um, and that's where we have the 2700 units. We'll talk about a deal here in a second. Um, so I did a couple of deals with Joe, met Andrew through Joe's um, um, uh, event here in, in Denver. And Andrew had also done a few, you know, sub, we didn't realize we were, we were co-GPing on the same thing. He was a student of Joe's as well. And um, he was in Texas and I, he was on, I was underwriting deals in, in LA, but deals in De- De- Dallas and San Antonio. I uh, was getting on best and final calls, but I couldn't crack the brokers. And Andrew was also looking at um, at deals in Texas, and he realized that you know through thank you thanks to Frank, I had a little bit more institutional quality underwriting, and he's like, man, I I should I should. I want to uh, clear when you say institutional underwriting, define that for our audience. Sure. So there's 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 analyzers you can buy online, not naming any that turn things green and looks great and it's hundred bucks. There, but then there's like what the big boys do, and that's what Frank came from, right? He was working for a big institutional shop that bought thousands of multifamily units across the country. And you need to understand the different levels, levers you need to pull in order to determine whether this deal, whether a deal pencils. So that experience working with Frank, not only did I help him introduce him to Joe, but he gave back to me in terms of helping me up my game because I'm mathematically oriented. I'm a, I'm a structural engineer, right? I can know how to build a freaking spreadsheet. And so it was just like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And I just kept going down that road with him. And then I started applying on my own or the, the deals I was trying to hunt for. Um, because I knew I wanted to be my own lead operator and that's where I met Andrew and that's where Andrew had he was boots on the ground in Texas but I wasn't there and he had he didn't have that institutional level of management because I also you know structural engineer came with a just just a little bit different he was more like the Joe to the Frank and Joe like he was the marketer he came from marketing but he had something that I didn't have which was boots on the ground and so from there we went off and underwrote a ton of deals in San Antonio and Austin I think we underwrote like 60 or 70 deals until we found that one deal. And that is when we're like, all right, it's 192 units. I need someone who can be on this KP with me who knows how to freaking, who's done this before. And that's where Frank comes back around. And I said, hey, dude, I I don't ask this lightly, but I need some, I, to me to qualify for, for an agency loan, I need your experience. Will you come on and KP with me? And, and Andrew, Andrew, with us, I should say. And that, it, and he, he and said, it came full circle, came right? Full circle. I mean, before you guys were friends, you introduce you you provide value to him, give him you know an introduction, help him raise money. He goes off, he's off to the races, and then what? Two or three years later, it comes back around. Yep. Yeah, I mean that's how. It's and then worked. again, it, was, it wasn't that I was planning that. You weren't planning, and it wasn't in writing. It was just like, hey, if I provide value, disproportionate value, help someone, I know you know the great thing is is that it's the same thing for me in Denver. Like, there's so many people that I've helped and added value. That I know that if I need something, I can pick up the phone and call, and there's no issue with me asking for something. Right. Like when you help people, you kind of have a little bit like uh, an IOU. Yes. And, and it's like unspoken, where it's like, hey, I know that I can call so many different people across the city or the country. That's like, I know that if I need an attorney, a broker, a lender, a blah, 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 or if I need, you know, capital last minute that I've done so many things for multiple people that I can, I can ask that off. and yep. it's, and it's going to come back. And you did the same thing. 100%. So you, yep. you come back, you ask, his name was uh, and Frank. Fr- Frank, 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 you're like, Hey Frank, I need you to be a KP, which is a, what is a key, key principle, key principle, key principle. And that's sort of like bringing the multifamily experience, the lending experience. So when you go to the lender and say, Hey, Hey lender, Freddie, Franny, Fanny, you know, they're like, yeah, we'll lend to you, but who who in the in the GP has has done these big deals before? You know, they're not just going to give 192, you know, to Andrew and me, like two kids. Because what know. was the what was the debt that you needed? How uh, much debt? Uh, we needed about twelve million dollars. Twelve million dollars, and typically the key principal needs to have 
what 10 percent of that in liquid and then the whole need gp to needs to have the 10 percent told the whole gp need to have it liquid and then the kp needs to have how much of that so, in his so, balance sheet so, so, so balance least. it's a balance and liquidity is just falls all directly if you have five people in the gp or 10 people in the gp it just collectively you need to qualify uh 10 and the 15 percent rule for the liquidity and so frank just bought a lot more yeah a lot just a big heavier weight to the to, to that scale right so we tipped it to say that we can say yes and, and went off and did the deal together so again we wouldn't be sitting here today with 2700 units without him you know, help helping out. you get you yeah get you off you know get the boulder going down down, down exactly, the hill exactly. and what was how much ca- equity did you have to raise for that first deal 6.9 million bucks 6.9 million dollars mm-hmm. so talk a little bit about what that process was like because that's oh. a that's a pretty big raise yeah for your first deal. and scary because <laughs> right, yeah. did Go. you have to go non-refundable on yep. earnest money yep we went, we only had 50 percent of it raised and we went through dd and we're like all right we're gonna somehow figure and this how out how much is there earnest money on that do you remember uh that i think it was like two hundred fifty thousand dollars. it was a, ch- it was it was a, big, a ch- change it was a big chunk of change back then like it was sort of like it's got gray hairs in the back of my head for sure um but the other thing is like i on that story on that first deal we had in we had said okay we've got a bunch of people in the gp that can help raise us money and we can do all this stuff we're gonna raise a bit you're gonna you're gonna have, you're gonna have a role and we brought on uh, a crowdfunding website to raise 1.5 million bucks and they completely shit the bed they tanked yeah tank the bed really? i've heard that a lot yeah tank oh, the bed this right. is sort of like three weeks before closing they didn't raise a dollar didn't raise a dollar didn't raise a dime and, and so now we're back for 1.5 yeah we're now back calculating like how much do we need just to close like because we were over raising for the capital expenditure and and thank thanks to frank for saying i'll only kp this deal if you raise all the capex yourself so that 6.9 wasn't what we needed to close we had like a million and a half in there of so pretty much that crowdfunding was all the capex money um and all the fees for us so like we weren't going to get any fees so we're like i think we can close but like we need to find this money and I don't, I'm I'm not very woo woo, but like you know, someone calls me out of the blue, and I'm going to call him uh, Whale Investor, uh, and I have a 15 minute conversation with him. He got sent the package accidentally because this capital company was trying to get our debt from us from this deal. Yeah, some young guy at the at the capital place accidentally sent the deck out to like their 10,000 email list. And this one guy saw my, num- my number on the back and calls me. He invests $1.3 million, him and his brother. 20 minute conversation. Again, none of that was planned. It was completely kismet. It was completely like whoever looks above me, you know, Jesus, Allah, all the bloody things, you know, whoever. I was like, and it saved our bacon. Like and Save, <laughs> saved our bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and he's yeah. been an investor. He's, he's actually invested one more time. He's the least... Hands, he's the least hands-on, least fussy investor. We don't hear from him, a peep out of him. And he was just like, he bet, like for our first deal he bet on, and he bet big, like 1.3 million bucks. It was huge. That's amazing. Oh, yeah, again, that's cool. You can't you can't script that. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. That that's was... incredible. So you guys go on to close mm-hmm. that deal. Mm-hmm. It goes well. You're still in that deal? Still in that deal today. We're selling that deal next year. Um, lesson learned on that deal. We got fixed rate, interest rate, no, back then, you know, everyone thought interest rates were going to the moon. So this so we, is 2015? 16. 16. Um, everyone thought interest rates were going to the moon. We end up locking for 4.2% Freddie uh, seven-year fixed. And the and reason was because to try and hedge with investors is, okay, investors, yes, it's our first deal. But guess what? We've got this fixed rate yep. debt and it's 42 and yeehaw. And, you know, now looking back, we're like, ah, oh, crap. You know, because we can't now we can't get four point two is still not horrible. It's not horrible, I mean, but yeah. like incident, we, we the prepay on a fixed. You're rate, trying to protect the downside, which exactly, is smart, right? Exactly. So now we are four and a half going on five years into it. Next year will be six years, so the prepay will be a lot less. Um, but looking back on it, we shouldn't have got the. We, we could have exited that deal probably three years into it and had a run on the board sooner if we'd got a little bit more flexible exit. But again, being newbies, we think you're still you know, going to get a massive win. You've we paid down principal. You've had cash flow. I mean, it's going to do extremely well. It's going to be just fine. Yeah. Yeah, but it's always better to be more conservative. Right. More conservative, I think, because if interest rates did spike up, you'd be saying something very different now. Correct. But great, your crystal ball is amazing. Yeah. Hey, yeah. crystal ball, crystal ball is wrong, but didn't go quite as a plan. But you still go, you st- It's still a win for you. Hundred percent. So I want to jump into this 284 unit in Austin, Texas, mm-hmm. called the Reserve at Walnut Creek. Because you sent us, a, sent us over this deal memo, and we want to go through and actually unpack this a little bit. Sure. So give us the quick overview about what this property is like. Like, what is it? So it's a 2000 and 
three vintage, I believe it is. And this was a deal that came to us off market. This was our fifth deal we've ever we ever did. We closed on that in two thousand and it must be in two thousand and eighteen. Uh, 18, it must be 18. And it came to us because uh, it actually had, it came to us off market through the brokers we'd bought the first four deals through. And it had some foundation issues. And a lot of people would have ran away from that. And and, and had substantial foundation issues, which means um, the buyers before us bought it, probably for a song, and they installed uh, 1,200 piers, concrete piers below the foundations. And for people who don't understand, like being a structural engineer, Things, there's two things you can be certain in life. That's taxes, death, and the third thing is that the ground will always move. <laughs> the ground will always move. It's, it's, we live on the planet Earth. The, 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 it's moving all the bloody time. We're, we're going around the sun. The ground will always move. Uh, and, and things will, will compress and, and, and he, it's called heaving. And when it, when it gets wet, it expands. When it dries out, it, it contracts. And in, in this pocket of Austin, it was notoriously bad for this type of in situ soil conditions. And so they fixed a lot of it. And we were, and I got comfortable. Like you know, Andrew didn't know what right. what was going. On, but this I was sort of, right in your wheelhouse, right in my I mean, wheelhouse. Right in your and wheelhouse. we bought this thing for five and a half cap. Like this is and this is 2018. This is the best cap rate we've ever bought anything at. And um, it, but it was more to do with like we got we got comfortable with the risk. And through my background of just having to be structural engineering, that we got really comfortable with it. Because what the risk was what, even though they had fixed it, that it could still get worse, yeah, it, or it, that it, it wasn't it, fixed it, it, it properly. It, 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 no, not that it wasn't fixed it was properly. Still it was going, just, it was still just, moving. It was still moving. Things right. are still going to move. Like you wow. still, it's going to be an ongoing issue regardless of what happens in the future, right? You can you can mitigate it so much. So what helped you get comfortable with that during due diligence? Well, the fact that they did they already spent a ton of money on it, and then we got in ec- engineers and experts, you know, actual engineers and experts who are licensed, and we're like, what's the ongoing maintenance of this thing? Like what's a ballpark figure, and you know the bank had to get okay on it. We I remember being on calls with the bank with the engineer, and we sort of put stuff in escrow for it. We have we have two t- twice a year. We got we get guys come out surveys to survey the level of everything, and it's been an absolute cracking little deal. So, have you had to put any more yep, money? We in do, the, oh, you we, have. We have, and that's but we knew that. We right? knew we, that. It, was, it, was, it was to your budget, to your forecast. Yeah, to, to your forecast, and even you know it was some like some years we didn't spend any money last year, but the year before we had to put a little bit more than what we expected. I think we had to put like another thirty or forty peers in one of the buildings. Um, it's like it's it sounds scary, but it's like it's actually quite simple and easy when you when you understand it, and it's just stabilizing the earth. Now you could go back and say that the developer of this asset back in the day when it built it did not stabilize the in situ soils well enough, and they probably didn't. Um, but that's cheap, you know. That's cheap Texas building for you. <laughs> People cutting corners, so yeah. Okay, so you found this off market deal from the same brokers you bought other deals from. You were comfortable with the risk on the soil or the moving soil on there. Uh, made sense. What was the underwriting like right now? What was the business plan numbers well, the, like? Well, the, the business plan was they actually were showing quite a really, really good rental pops on the unrenovated versus the classics. And the current ownership had already proven uh, a value-add story. So we were just going to go come and continue that value-add story. They'd only done a handful of units. I think I, I can't even remember. The, it probably says it in there like 10 or 12. And they were getting like $250 rental pops. So we underwrote to that sort of level. Obviously, the numbers are going to look great when you do that. Um, and th- 59 units. 59 units was it. Yeah. Okay, there we go. But then we're, we're coming in now, and I know four and a half years later, two and a half years later, we have gone through all the renovations, and now we're coming back and touching their old renovations now, bringing them up to a, a standard that you know people want. And we're crushing it on, on this deal. And Again, a debt. There's a debt instrument on that deal that we didn't like either, but you know, lessons learned on that. But it's something that we got really comfortable with, and the cap rates are really, really impressive. So when you say debt instrument, you didn't like. You had to assume their note. No, I didn't have to assume their note. We got again another another risky time in the debt world, and that was when Freddie was higher than bridge loans for some silly reason. At the end of 2018, in December of 2018, there was something going on, and we ended up going with a um, a, a regional bank. And we got a, 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 a rate cap on it. No, 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 a swap, a swap. So we, we we set the bar at, I think it was 4.9% and it was a swap. So, you know, when, when interest rates go down, that swap becomes more expensive, but it always maintain it. will never go above a 4.9. Um, today, again, it acts like a prepay. So like today we'd like to get out of it, but you got a big prepay on it. Um, now, the beauty of this is that cap rates in Austin are now compressed to 4%. So 
maybe we could in a couple of years' time get out of it without you know much of much. So I want to rewind a, a few minutes ago because you said you bought about a five and a half cap, which was an amazing cap rate at the time. Assuming that didn't have these structural issues, what would have been like the going cap rate without the the scary stuff? There would have been a seventy five basis point swing. It probably would have been wow. four 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 point seven five four point six at the time. You know, and it's only just continue to compress and with all the you know the, the teslas and the googles and the oracles of the world moving to austin so uh, and we're seeing incredible growth in terms of the average in place rent versus what it was when we bought it versus what we are today and that's that's the big thing you're buying for yeah talk about that because i think denver austin nashville you know three of the markets that have just grown disproportionately over the last year with covid people want to live there it's really a lifestyle city 24 7 mm-hmm. city so talk about what the rents were when you bought it and what they are now, and then yeah, what you had to put into it. Can you flip through? Because I was actually going to call the early. What, what, is the, what does the forecast say on the? Should we keep going? I think there's. Uh, got uh, the capex budget yeah, here. Yeah, we've got everything the there. Capital. The overview. We've got, there it's we go. There, there we go. Beautiful looking place, by the way. Where beautiful. Is this? There, there we go. What's this say here? So the current rents uh, at the time were about twelve hundred bucks. Like today. For a one bedroom or two bedroom? That was average across um, one, two. So, so for one bedroom, a thousand bucks. For uh, a bigger one bedroom, eleven hundred, but a bit under uh, twelve hundred. Average for two bedrooms was about thirteen hundred, and a big three bedroom would have been just shy of fifteen hundred bucks. Today we're well north of thirteen fifty, you know, fourteen hundred dollars, and it's so it's still very cheap compared to. So roughly what a 20%, twenty percent, twenty twenty plus percent bump in rents. Yeah, wow. and that's and that's just, and across uh, how many units is it? Two eighty four. Wow. And that, that's through value add strategy, right? right? We've, we've, we've turned nearly 100 units in this property and we'll continue to turn more units. Um, we, we completely transformed. We, there was an existing half basketball court inside, indoor. We turned that into a massive gym. We changed the club room. Like it's a very impressive when you when you walk in there, like to live there. And I, I'm a big fitness guy. Like people automatically think, oh, there's a massive gym here. I don't need to go and pay for a gym membership. No, you don't. Come live with us, you know? So, um, but that's, you, you talk about the, the markets you just mentioned, that's still really cheap compared to LA. You know, for a one bedroom, we're talking earlier about your, your rents back in the day in Hermosa oh, That's like Beach. half. Yeah. yeah. So the whole story here is where these cities are growing: Nashville's, Denver's, Austin's of the world. I'm still buying stuff today at where in place rents are eleven hundred dollars. Now, if I project over the next five years that they will grow ten percent a year, or so it goes from you know a thousand bucks to fifteen hundred dollars. Fifteen hundred dollars is still very very cheap in five years' time. Now, if you believe that rental growth story. And that's how it's going to force your NOI to go up, right? And that's what you got to hang your hat on. So people who buy in Denver at cap rates of 4%, like what are they betting on? Well, they're betting on the fact that rents are going to continue to grow up and go up, right? And if you've got really affordable rents, when you look at it on paper compared to other major cities, $1,100 is pretty freaking cheap. I want to take a left turn here because this is where your international perspective becomes very interesting. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we've talked about this podcast yet, but you know, what's the, what do, what are the cap rates in Australia and how do people buy properties down there compared to cap rates here? Because, oh, 4%, I'll still buy. Like yeah. you're still comfortable with it. A lot of people are like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Hell no, I'm not so, going to buy that. Yeah. So, so two things. Multifamily doesn't exist in Australia. Like I couldn't go buy 280 units in Australia. It's a whole different ball game. Um, financing instruments are not there. Uh, but in general, like you go buy a four cap building in in Austin, like you go buy maybe a four cap um, office tower in New York City, which you probably could get these days. That's really cheap when you compare it to London or Tokyo or Hong Kong, where they're at like 2% cap rates. Um, in Australia, cap rates are really, you know, it's a, if you look at the commercial side, they're probably less than 3%. So everything is still very affordable here in the United States. And given the growth factor, and given the fact that the GDP in Texas is greater than that of all of Australia, is this like, <laughs> really? like that's yeah. how, like, when you put it on, this, on a scale like that. That's an amazing perspective right there. Right. So then the you, GDP of Texas is greater, bigger, than, greater than all, all than the Australia. entire country of Australia. Correct. We only wow. have 25 million people, 26 million people in Australia. And I, I think Texas is at 40 million people. I love the international perspective. I mean, you talked about it, the same thing. Like you get off the boat, you're in New York and you're like, oh my gosh, there's these meetups to network with real real estate professionals and they'll give away the information for free. Yep. And to you, that was like a light bulb moment because in Australia, they didn't have that. But people in New York are walking every day by the library, the coffee shop where you guys are meeting. And they're like, oh, those idiots. They're in there like wasting their time listening to some guy talk about real estate. And I'm going to go you know, down here and have a drink. And you're just that perspective of, hey, it's like this in other parts of the country and in the United States, what people will consider sometimes the best country in the world, that we can do this. We can buy a four, five or six cap. And in Australia, I'm buying a three. I mean, just having that, I feel the same way coming from South America. You know, when I th- see, th- you know, how difficult life is in 
Colombia, a third world country, and I come here, it's like, man, we have we have unlimited opportunity. You yeah. know? And so I think obstacles with that perspective appear much smaller when you have that kind of bigger perspective, just taking a step back and like, man, we have it so good here. Oh, we have unlimited opportunity. Every day I wake up and I'm like, we have we can do anything we want. You can literally, like, it's amazing. Like I can walk down or drive down any street and be like, yeah, someday I could own that. Yeah, it's great. Like, there's very few places in the world where people can think I would, uh, and dream that. As I said, I wouldn't have, I couldn't go and buy 284 units in Australia. It just doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. It's all condos. It's built for condo market. So, but lo- knowing what I know now and going back there, when I if I do in the future, like I could go and crush it in a different way. You know, different different you know asset class. Just having that perspective. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, I love that. I thought just even hearing just those eyes of like getting off, you know, being in New York and just seeing just something as simple as a meetup as like a great opportunity. Right. You know, that simple, just starting back at the ground zero, like yep. a meetup, Let's man, this is great. I'm going to go embrace it. I'm going to dive both feet in. I'm going to get involved and I'm going to meet people and try and add value and build relationships because yep. this isn't a tremendous opportunity. Most people just take that for granted. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and there's value, you know, even this deal in reserve, there's value in everything you can do. It's about taking the blinkers off and understanding what that value is, whether it's going to a meetup event and understanding the value you can extract from that from someone you might meet there, you know, might bump into, or looking at a deal and going, well, everyone's not touching this with a 10 foot pole, but we can see the value because we get comfortable with certain aspects of it. Where someone would like to look at that and be like, how are you making money on that deal? It's like, this is how. So, yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's so cool. So, circling back around to here, you bought this place for just over $36 million. What was the capital raising? Like on that, like what was the, the was finance? A, I think it was a seventeen million dollar equity raise on that. Is you guys that, raised seventeen million dollars. Sixteen point. No, here it is. Here, sixteen. Jeez. Sixteen. So point, you almost half. Half of the purchase price. Fifteen. So fifteen. Fifteen seven five. Yeah. So nearly because you, you got to think we 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 raised for um, a bit of the capex. We raised for all the fees. Right. Raised for a reserve. You know, you got to you, you. And this is the conservative underwriting. If if the deal can t- tick all the boxes and you've over raised that much money to have cash on hand. Um, then it's a win. It's a the win downside's way more protected. Yeah. So what were the projected returns with raising that much equity on so that we'll size of a deal? Here. We're looking at on net, net to LP of 15.13. Uh, and this, I think it was a seven-year hold, 2.37 equity multiple and an 8% cash on cash. Yeah, in over. Austin, Texas, one of the fastest growing markets in the country where yep. downside super protected. Yep. And the pro forma, you're probably going to, the actual numbers when you sell this, and you're selling this deal next year? No, this deal won't be sold for probably another couple of years. A couple of years. But, but, um, but we, we could, if, we could, we, if we could, we would because, but it might be a deal as well that you go refi. And just hold. And, and just hold, you know, because you, you refi 50%. Because it's kicking off cash flow, rents are only going up, Austin, Texas, I mean, right. all of the it's numbers. A 2000, it's a 2003 build, so the, the just it's got fire sprinklers, it's got nine foot ceilings, just the bones are better, right? right compared to a 1980s asset where it's like eight foot ceilings. Yeah, why it. sell? Yeah. yeah. You got a great asset and a great market that's only appreciating, and it's only getting more competitive to buy there. 100%. I mean, you got buyers from all over the world buying Austin. Same Correct. thing as Denver. Correct. I mean, it's just very, very competitive. Yeah, great work. Love that. And then you talked about a deal. So give us, you know, give us, uh, you know, maybe the overview. You're selling a deal next week. Yep. One of your first deals. Yep. So talk, you know, tell the audience a little bit about, I mean, so that deal's got a first, different. Yeah. That's going to be a different flavor. And that was a that was a deal we and this was before this deal, the, the reserve deal. We bought a a, 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 a a two pack, so it was like portfolio. Um, that deal, uh, we bought it and from a a, a seller out of Portland, Oregon. Um, and we just went in and did our value add strategy. Um, now with two deals, one's always going to be carrying the other. You know, they're not all going to be the same, and they sort of they can hide things. But you know, we've 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 ironed those th- those issues out, and we've had to sell it two and a half years two and a half years later. The beauty about those deals is that we got bridge financing on them, so we are la- we can we can sell. We had an eighteen month lockout, and our note or our ter- first term was going to come up at the end of this year. And we could do an extension, or we could pop our head out and say, "Who wants to pay us some money for this?" Unlike the unlike the reserve, unlike the first deal we did, where we were sort of locked into our debt, we have the opportunity. So we had the flexibility um, to to go out. Now on the flip side, we did take a lot of leverage on that deal, so we actually didn't raise as much money, um, which is can be a good and a bad thing, right? Again, we got a, about five five and uh, one point. 5.1% interest rate, which isn't very good. Uh, and on a 75% loan to cost, people might think, oh, that's great. Like, no, I, I rule of thumb. You can now, get under four right now. Yeah. We get under four. We can't refi. You know, we, we can refi if we didn't sell it. But for the last two and a half years, it's been at that 5%, which has been wow. a, it's been a, a high jump, high hurdle to jump. But if you can 
the, the lessons from those sort of stuff is like, we don't ever want to go more than 70% loan to cost. We typically just go 70% loan to value and don't, don't worry about the cap. We just raise CapEx ourselves, but like we did here at Reserve. Uh, so yeah, your, your leverage is much lower. But uh, giving our first bridge deal, we sort of went, we sort of maxed out the, the, the proceeds. And, you know, it's worked out fine, but there was there were some times where like looking back and like, I think I would have done a little differently. What was your the interest rate. forecast the whole period on there? Five years. Five years. So, so you're selling two and a half just because the cap because rates compressed so much yep. and, and kept and, the and, financing? And we get, we're getting the number. So we get, I think we're giving investors like a 15.75%, uh, 1.45 in two and a half years. And I can't, I don't know what the cash, I can't remember the cash on cash return is, but uh, that's, yeah. So you're, that's but you're getting good. seller returns yeah, to your, yeah. yeah. Like it's, it, it, and here's the big thing, like we are 12 deals deep and this will be our first exit, right? So we, people are now asking us like, when's the first exit? We need to see your proof in the pudding. Don't just tell me we've never missed a pref payment. That doesn't mean anything we need. So this is also an opportunity for us hmm. to, to, sh to, to, to uh, shake some deals loose from the portfolio to say, there's my skin on the yeah, wall. Yeah, get a win. Yeah, get, get a, a win. win. Yeah. yeah. I get a it's bit huge. of money in my pocket, great. Not as much as I thought I was going to get, but the no, investor's still great. The investor's yeah. going to get. And it you learn some lessons. I mean, that's the great thing about real estate. I mean, how many times have I come in here, Chris, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm getting my butt kicked, right? I mean, so many fires, so many problems, so many issues, and I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe what I'm going through right now. But the beautiful thing is, I'm learning lessons, and we're making money. Yep. I mean, it's an incredible, it's just an incredible opportunity. We're in one of the greatest periods to be in real estate. I mean, debt is cheap. There's all kinds of liquidity out there. And, you know, times are tough and there are a lot of people struggling, but there's so much opportunity, like you said, if you have the right perspective. Let's change lanes. You know, this the show is called The Tribe of Multifamily Mentors. So you've touched on it earlier, but talk about the impact and summarize it for us that mentors have had in your life and maybe a word of wisdom on how the audience can go and find a mentor in their current stage of their yeah, men, like again, I came from very, uh, I wasn't very hot on mentors. I think I explained that earlier. Like I was put it off for so many years until I found Joe and paid very little money for him, but it was enough to, to, to prove to myself. Mentors are just, you know, they, they need, you, you need someone in your court to, to, to rate, rise up to the occasion, right? To, to go and double down on yourself, you know, take a bet on yourself. You know, the, the Kobe Bryant's of the world, the Michael Jordan's, all the best um, you know, athletes in the world have coaches and uh, in business you need the same thing and so you know and coaches will change over the time like i have a different business coach today than i had from joe it's not a, it's not actually about the execution joe was very execution orientated i now need the mindset and the wisdom of like making sure my my two senses my, my top two inches are good you know i've figured out the business is now actually becoming a better leader and becoming um uh, a better ceo for, for 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 growing the company to to its best potential so there's different types of mentors that you're going to have along the way and that's okay but having mentors is real i don't think i'll not ever have a mentor moving forward you know and, and they will change but going out and getting someone who can who can sort of look over your shoulder and say yeah you're doing the right thing or no you're not doing the right thing can help you just be give you confidence to know that you are going down the right path when you're when you're talking about the the new coach, you have more mindset, more business. Can you talk about that more? I'm very yeah, curious about for that. Sure. Uh, so, very. Uh, my wife actually introduced me to her. She's actually a little bit more woo woo than uh, than than than, <laughs> woo -woo. <yeah>. <laughs> than, <laughs> than the business side. It's it's more listening to not having the mind run. Your like you everyone's in their head a lot. Like we're all oh sit, yeah we're all sitting listen watching our own cinema twenty four seven with the chatter in our head. And it's more listening to your gut. Uh, and, and other parts of your body to be more in tune with what you know. Your body knows what you're doing. You, you know, it already knows where it's going. And it's just about trying to get the mind aligned with with the gut and the heart um, and just being a little bit more self-aware uh, self to help be a better leader. And so really taking care of yourself first, figuring out, you know, issues that I we all have issues right we're not we're not gonna we're not we're not sitting here we've all got mental chatter figuring that stuff out first in order so you can come and be a good the best leader the best husband the best you know future husband a future father you know all those things best son best brother and that all sort of comes back around and if you don't have your business will fail if you don't have those other pillars figured out as well well, I think that's really cool you share that you're doing that because I mean from the outside say wow I mean hearing your story up until two minutes ago mindset 
why the hell is Reed using his <laughs> mindset when he's done all this amazing stuff in what just under a decade? Like, uh, so to be to be brutally honest, um, I, throughout this whole time, it's been my mum. My, my I lost my mum. Uh, well, she put she passed away in Australia, and it was uh, it was very tough. I was out here, you know, chasing my dream, very probably egotistical, sort of like, am I doing the right thing? And she said to me, like, Reed, you are doing the right thing. I, I went home three days before she passed, and it was just like this real, you know, realization that life is short. If you're not even going to enjoy the journey, what the f are you doing? Trying to mm-hmm. even trying to you know be working for someone you hate or you know hustling all the time. Everyone will hustle, right? You're not going to get to financial freedom in 30 days or two years. Like, wait, I won't. Yeah, exactly. I'm telling you right now, you won't do it. And people who who, who bang that drum that will, you have to enjoy the journey. So if you're if your mind is constantly running and going, I need to be here and constantly looking five years in the future, not enjoying today, then things are going to pass you by. Kids are going to grow up in front of you. you know, you're know, going to lose family members. You're not going to be there for big, big occasions. And someone said to me one time, when you're sitting at 70 years of age and you're telling your grandkids whether you own 10,000 units or 50,000 units, do they really care? No, they don't. They really care they're sitting with their granddad and it's spending yeah. time with your family. And so that to me, through the whole thing that I've come through with losing my mom and stuff like that and being on this journey has really helped me realize that I've got to in, stop living in this, like it's going to be good someday. It's going to be good someday. It, it's good today and enjoy today. And that help, That just takes off a lot more shackles from a mental point of view, from takes the load off your chest, off your shoulders. And has allowed allowed me to be a little bit see more by just figuring out the chatter in your own head. It does that does that help? <laughs> oh, that's that's very uh, clarifies a lot. Thank you. The pleasure. So one of the things that Chris and I like to ask that I think I've heard you talk about before on your podcast is you know just the superpower. Like, what is the one thing that you would say I this is what separates me from everyone else? So what would you say? your superpower is? I, I, I think it goes back to the international perspective. I think it helps a lot. Uh, superpower, if you want to you know, egotistically call that, but just a different perspective and coming, you know, as you said, well, some people would walk past their mentor, uh, uh, you know, a meetup and go, what the hell are they doing that on a Saturday for? You know, I remember getting on buses to Baltimore and going to see derelict $15,000 houses and uh, oh. and and my my you know, my wife now girlfriend not understanding at the time. My buddy's like, dude, why are you coming in? Like, let's go, let's go play rugby or something. He's like, I want to learn this thing. I need to do it. I need to spend time doing this. And it's just a different perspective. So coming to this country and has been a really eye opener, and it's taught me a lot. But also, I've been able to un- take a lot from it because of my perspective of coming from a country that we have a lot in Australia. Don't get me wrong, but from the investment side, it's a little different. So yeah, unlimited opportunity. I love it. I've learned so much. I've been inspired. I've you know, motivated. I love hearing your story. I really like hearing how, you know, your international perspective, you know, I can very much relate with that. I think people in the audience and on the Q&A definitely related with that. And how can people engage with you? How can they find you? Tell us, you know, you've written several books. So, you know, give give yourself a plug, talk about the books, talk about where people can connect with you. The easiest way to go to readgoosens.com. Uh, it's R E E D G O O S S E N S dot com. You're going to find my two books there. I've got Investing in the US, which is podcast in the book form, and I've got Ten Thousand Miles to the American Dream. Both are there. Uh, you can you can hit me up at info at readgoosens dot com. Uh, you can you can check out what I invest in, and if you want to ever become an investor or just you know meet up and talk shop, you know hit hit me up at info at, at readgoosens. So yeah, great. Reed, this has been a pleasure. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Hey, mate, put another shrimp on the barbe. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. Did you? Did you you're, from, of, you're from London? <laughs> that was supposed to be Australian. <laughs> You've been practicing my that wife, for, yeah, my, for how, how many years? Wife, I, sometimes I like to talk in accents. I just thought I'd throw that out there. We can work on that later. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll another shrimp on the barbe. We'll, 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 that's a good one. We'll give you, we'll give you an A for effort. Uh, a for <laughs> effort. Yeah, yeah. I feel good about that. Thank you, lads, awesome. for having me on the show. Thanks, guys. You're listening to the Multifamily Mentor Show. Join the conversation. 